Welcome. You are live with PBS Books and our series with authors and illustrators brought to you in partnership with libraries across America and your local PBS stations. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Heather Marie Montilla. We're here to celebrate Asian American and Pacific Islander Month, which is every May. The first Asian American came to the United States back more than 150 years ago. And in fact, a Japanese immigrant arrived on May 7th in 1843, which is why the month of May is when we celebrate Asian American and Pacific Islander month. So thank you for being here. If you'd like to explore more resources about Asian and Pacific Heritage Month, you can visit www.pbslearningmedia.org. From interactive word searches to videos, you'll find an array of fun activities you can take advantage of for K through 12. And I encourage you to go there to find more about um, the achievements and the accomplishments of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in our country. So what are we doing here? Here, we're here to actually celebrate. And what better way to celebrate the month of May and Asian American and Pacific Islander month, but to bring to you an amazing conversation and an amazing book called Drawn Together. Drawn Together is by Min Le and Dan Santat, and they were collaborat collaborators on this book. Um, and so what we thought we would do is before we begin with a quick read aloud, is I thought I would take a moment to introduce Min and Dan. So Min is a national, <clears throat> excuse me, a national early childhood policy expert. And he's also the author of The Perfect Seat, Let Me Finish, Drawn Together, and most recently, Lift. He's written for the New York Times, the Huffington Post. He went to Dartmouth and did his master's in education at Harvard University. Welcome, Min. Dan <laughs> is an author and illustrator of the Caldecott winning The Adventures of Beekle the unimaginary friend, um, as well as the cookie fiasco and many, many others. He is also the creator of Disney's animated hit, The Replacements. Thank you both for being here today. We're so thrilled to begin this event and be able to investigate a little bit more about Asian American um, his, excuse me, Heritage Month. Um, and so here we're going to start with a video of Drawn Together. I think we're having technical difficulties. So just one more minute before we have sound. If not, we will have Min read the book from the comfort of his home in, in California. Just hold on one moment. Hi there. Hi there. It's Min Lei. Thank you so much for joining me today for story time. Um, I am going to read a very personal book um, to you today, and it's called Drawn Together, illustrated by the amazing Dan Santat, who is a good friend and also one of my favorite author illustrators. In fact, I have 
one of his books, The Adventures of Beagle, on my office wall. Um, but this book is very personal to me because it is inspired by my relationship with my own grandparents. I'm Vietnamese American, so I was born here in the United States, but my bridging from Vietnam and my grandparents spoke mostly Vietnamese um, while I spoke mostly English. Whenever I go to the house, I love them so much. They love me so much, but like I still had trouble talking to them, communicating with them. I'm not sure if you have the same experience with anyone in your family. But so I wanted to write a book that kind of captured both the, the depth of love and emotion there, but also talked about like the struggles that can come with, with these relationships. So what I didn't realize is that Dan, who is Thai American, had a similar relationship with his grandmother who spoke, um, I think, exclusively Thai. And so they had a similar communication gap. So it's a very personal book to both of us. So much so that if you look at the dedication page, you'll see <coughs> we dedicate to our grandparents. There's my grandfather right there, and there's Dan's grandmother. <coughs> so, shall we begin? Are you ready? Here we go. Drawn together by me, illustrated by Dan Santat. Um, and you'll see this, this lovely gold sticker on the front because we were fortunate enough to receive the um, Asian Pacific American Librarian Association Award for, for Best Picture Book of last year. So I'm very honored by that. So our book begins with this boy who's being dropped off by his mom. He goes up and rings the doorbell and his grandfather answers the door. And he, you can tell, his grandfather is super excited to see him. He's like, oh, my grandson's here. So they greet each other with this traditional Thai greeting. And the grandfather waves goodbye to his daughter. And then the grandfather lets the boy come inside. And the boy walks in and he's, you know, he's not so sure. He's looking a little bit iffy about this. But they go inside and sit down to eat. And the grandfather's made himself this beautiful bowl of noodle soup. Um, but because he loves his grandson and he wants him to be happy, he makes him a hot dog and french fries. And because he's a good grandfather, he also adds a little side salad to make sure that he gets his vegetables. But they sit down to eat. And the grandson asks, So, what's new, Grandpa? And the grandfather responds with a question in Thai. Um, but unfortunately, they can't understand each other, so that's as far as they can go. Um, and a quick note for those of you who are reading along at home. Um, on this page, you'll see right above the mom's car are the translations for all the, the Thai text. So the grandfather here is actually saying, how are you doing? So the boy's saying, how, what's new, Grandpa? The grandfather's saying, how are you doing? They're so close, they're trying to have a conversation, but that's as far as they can get. So they continue eating. So afterwards they sit down and they watch a movie and it looks super exciting, right? Um, there's a guy in the corner shouting, he's actually shouting dragon. Um, but the, the grandfather's watching his grandson to see how he's, how he's doing. And he asks a question in Thai, which is, and the boy asks, can we watch something else? So here the grandfather's actually asking, would you like to watch something else? So again, they're right there, they're so close but they, they're not able to communicate any further, so they keep watching the movie in silence. So eventually the boy gets tired. He's like, you know what? I can't follow along. I'm gonna go do something else. He goes to his bag. He pulls out some paper, some colored pencils and pens. And the grandfather walks over and peeks over his shoulder to see what his grandson is doing. And he sees that his grandson is drawing a picture of himself as a wizard. My grandfather gets super excited by this. So the grandfather goes off to the other room and he comes back with his own sketch pad and some paintbrushes and some ink. And now we hear the boy thinking and he thinks, right when I gave up on talking, my grandfather surprised me by revealing a world beyond words. And in a flash, we see each other for the first time. And here you'll see the boy as his wizard character. And on the other side, you see that the grandfather has painted a picture of himself as one of the heroes of his childhood. You see he has this amazing staff that's also a brush. 
Now, all the things we could never say come pouring out. You can see the grandson, my grandfather there creating all this, including this, this funny little monkey. So all the things we could never say come pouring out. And we build a new world that even words can't describe. You'll see down here in the corner, the grandson and the grandfather are standing there surveying this amazing world that they've created together. But just when we're closer than ever, so something's starting to happen. Just when we're closer than ever, that old distance. So the ground splits apart. You see the grandson on way on this side with the next to the grandfather's brush, and way on the other side is a grandfather standing next to the boy's magic wand. So that old distance comes roaring back, and you'll see this dragon come screaming out of the ground. So the grandfather grabs the boy's wand and he points it at the dragon. And the boy grabs the grandfather's staff and then he faces off against the dragon and says, this time, I'm not afraid. Because I know that together, we can make our way across. And if you look closely, the dragon just didn't disappear. The grandfather and grandson faced off against it and they transformed it into this bridge so instead of letting it keep them apart, they transform into something that will bring them together. So now after years of searching for the right words, we find ourselves happily speechless. And now we're back in the world of the grandfather's home. You can see the grandfather and grandson are hugging. And on the back walls, you can see that entire adventure, that whole world that we were just a part of was actually taking place in the artwork that the grandfather and grandson were making together. And then it's time to go home. The mom comes back and she is so excited because her father and her son finally found that connection, finally found that common ground. So the mom and grandfather hug. And as they wave goodbye, as they say goodbye, you'll see that the boy is holding one of the grandfather's paintbrushes and the grandfather is holding one of the boy's markers. So now that they've made that connection, that's something that they're going to continue to build upon. Um, so the grandfather waves goodbye with future adventures awaiting um, down the road. And that is Drawn Together. Um, I hope you enjoyed our, our book. Like I said, it comes from a very personal place. Um, my, my grandfather unfortunately passed away before I was able to share this book with him, but I'm confident he knew how I felt about, about our relationship. Um, that being said, for you all out there listening, if there are people in your life that you, that you haven't talked to in a while or you're kind of like struggling to figure out how to communicate with, um, I'm telling you, there's no time like the present to, to reach out and just let them know how you feel. Tell them you love them. I hope you enjoyed story time. Hopefully I'll be able to, to share some more stories with you in the future. Until then, have a great day. Bye. Ooh, I almost forgot something. There is a secret in this book um, that I want to share with you. So if you take this book and you take the, the cover off, the jacket, um, you take it off, you'll see that underneath is um, this sketchbook, which may look familiar to you. Uh, the, the scene where the grandfather um, runs out to the other room and comes back with, with his sketchbook. So that's a, that's a nice detail that, that Dan and our editor Rotem Moskovich and the art director Joanne Hill added. I think it makes the story really special. So I really wanted to make sure to share that with you. And now, bye for real. That was wonderful. So glad you could experience that with us. I love how Drawn Together touches on tradition, on heritage. It also really, for me, it touches on how the power of art, um, it can build connections and it can build communication in a really special, unique way. Um, so thank you. Thank you for the gift you both have given to us. I, I have some specific questions and I thought we could really start with Min. Um, and if you could talk a little bit about how you came up with the, the idea for this book, um, what inspired you and just to give you a little bit of insight, I, I counted and it seemed like there's only 115 words, including Thai words in this book. How did, how did you do it? Well, I, I think, um... My, 
if if I have a genius, it's in putting very few words on the page and letting Dan do most of the work. But <laughs> with with John together, it was interesting because usually as an author, if you're not the illustrator, then you sell your story to the publisher and then they connect you with an illustrator. For John together, it was backwards in that our editor had made the match and said, you know, I think you and Dan would be a good team. Um, so I got a uh, email from my agent saying, we have a chance to work with Dan. And this is right after he won the call account for the Adventures of Beagle. So like the biggest award you can win. And they said, um, we need two to three book ideas from you in the next two days because he's, his life is about to, to go, um, just become very wild and busy with all the award stuff. So I was like, okay, no pressure. Um, <laughs> what, but what... What made it even more interesting is that my wife and I had just gotten back from the hospital after the birth of our second son. So I had this very vivid memory of being up, in, up at night at like 3 a.m., rocking this newborn baby to sleep and trying to figure out like, what story do you write for someone who just won the, the biggest award in children's literature? Um, and luckily this is what came out. What's interesting is like um, across from me when I was holding my, my son was this painting in the background here of this elderly man and his uh, boy kind of like doing calligraphy together. So I, after the fact, like years later, I was like, I wonder if seeing that across the way kind of like helped um, give me the idea. But at the time I was just very much in the mode of thinking about my sons, thinking about family and my relationship with my grandparents and my parents. And um, luckily that's the idea that came out. And um, luckily for me, Dan thought it was good enough to run with. That's fantastic. Um, Dan, the artwork is so awe inspiring and you know it really it captures the imagination. How did you how did you begin? How did you start? Well, I'm going to uh, I'm going to use my computer to share some images. So here we go. Uh, just want to make sure you can all see that right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, I mean it was a it was a I've been illustrating books for about 15 years and um, over time, you know, I think, I think things can get a little stale. Sometimes um, maybe you're just going through the same process over and over again. And uh, it, it just feels like you're not evolving as an artist. And I actually took it upon this project to um, experiment a little bit more because I felt the, the art style in itself were characters in themselves, a, a reflection of uh, the personalities of the characters, if you will. Um, so I'll start with the influences that I have in, in Thailand. There's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of elaborate statues and beautiful, um, you know, details and everything. Uh, so here are some dragons. You'll see, you'll see statues of, uh, these, uh, I guess, I guess they're serpents, uh, all over Thailand. And also, um, a lot of these, uh, temple, temple guards, they're like these spirits that, that guard temples. And as you can see, <laughs> Bless my bless my Thai heritage. Uh, they they're they're really into just ornate details. So uh, when I when I decided to pursue this path of um, making the characters Thai, uh, and and for me I think it was selfishly a, a personal thing where I, I just never saw um, Thai characters in, in a book, and I, I just wanted to take that opportunity. Uh, but seeing upon this, uh, just realizing it would be a daunting task to draw every little detail in that um, I, 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 I felt like uh, it, it was a worthy challenge. Um, but I resorted back to old mediums. I, I, you know, for, for all these years, like I started doing more and more digital work uh, just because it was very efficient and quick. And uh, with this project, um, you know, I wanted to go back to old traditional mediums and uh, going back to pen and paper, something tactile uh, and, just, and just adopting, you know, different, uh, materials to create textures and so here we have uh markers and, and brush pens um you know pencils and and, and markers and, and paint brushes and india ink um and i would take all the assets and i would just i would just sketch them out on a piece of paper just kind of just making pieces of art and then using those uh to puzzle together uh illustrations um even even like textures uh in color pencil just kind of blending those uh, into the artwork. Uh, I mean, if for a lot of people were to look at my files of all the artwork that I've done, uh, I'd say, you know, half of it was narrative, art, uh, you know, ink work that I used for the book, and the other half was just, you know, 
uh, nonsense, like these, these scribbles and just these uh, watercolor washes that I would basically use and just um, assemble uh, on a computer. Um, I, also, I also adopted the Thai alphabet, if I could, uh, into, into the text. Um, so even if you see here in this slide for the title drawn together, they're, they're adopted from the Thai alphabet, but, um, you know, it's not, if you were to translate that from Thai, it would just be completely incoherent. In fact, my, my mother who's watching right now was, uh, <laughs> looking at it and said, this means nothing. And I said, well, you know, it's, 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 you know, appropriating a design principle. Um, here's some cover designs that we have. Uh, this has never been shown before. So this is a little treat. Um, you know, and, and this is something that you go through with uh, your art director and editor. Uh, editor is Rotem Moskovich and the, uh, and the uh, art director is uh, Joanne Hill, who I've worked with for a number of years. Um, and, you know, we had uh, like seven different designs. Uh, this was a personal favorite of mine, but I think uh, we all decided it was a little too busy. Uh, and then we got a little closer. But we decided to keep it simple, have the, have the grandfather and the grandson as the main focus. Um, and I remember, you know, typically when I'm working on an illustration like, like this, I'll, 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 do it, I'll do it digitally. And then um, what I did differently was that I was, I was just using the sketch as a template and then I would just integrate these pieces. And um, I'm just gonna show you the process here while I speak. Um, now the differing process here is that typically it would take me about a day to do an illustration like this, but uh, I was experimenting and I was really out of my comfort zone in this process that um, I remember my, I remember my uh, editor checking in on me because she knew how quickly I could work and she was asking me, uh, hey, how's that artwork going? I uh, haven't heard from you. You've been kind of quiet for the last two and a half months. And, you know, usually I could work on an illustration and know when it's done. But in this case, I was working on these illustrations feeling like I'm only gonna stop at these illustrations when I know the feeling is right. And so I was telling her, I said, I feel like I'm onto something here, but I can't tell you if it's good or bad because I don't necessarily know what I'm doing because it's so different and unconventional from my usual process. So. I'm gonna create this entire book and I'm gonna show you what I have and hopefully you'll like it. And so a piece like this, well, it varies. Some pieces took, some pieces took a day, some pieces took an entire week, some pieces took two weeks just because it didn't feel right. Um, and in the end, uh, you know, I think for me, just it was very, it was very liberating to be able to create something. Uh, and 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 create a piece of work that, you know, wasn't what I was normally accustomed to. It felt like I evolved, and so with that, that is the process of drawing together. That's amazing that you shared with us your creative process. Um, can I ask, did, when did you know you wanted to be an illustrator? You said you've done drawing for at least an illustrator for for fifteen years. When did you know? that you wanted to be an illustrator? Did you always know? Um, you know, I think for most of my life, I, I knew that art was a passion of mine. Um, you know, ever since, I remember I remember clearly when I was in kindergarten, uh, you know, the, the kindergarten teacher would just give us a simple assignment, uh, you know, draw an illustration from this book I just read you. And I remember, you know, I would draw the characters and I would draw, you know, the cabin or whatever that the character lived in. And I remember this, I remember this specifically. Uh, and you know, most children would probably just leave it at that. But I remember just going outside of the assignment and coloring the entire page. And uh, you know, a parent-teacher conference one day where uh, you know it was one of those assignments where I got two stars instead of one. And uh, you know, and I remember having a parent-teacher conference. I remember the kindergarten teacher saying, you know, like your son's very talented. You might want to consider getting him art classes. And my parents saying, well, yeah, you know, that's nice, but you know, like, there's really no profession in art. And as, as the years went on, a, a, lot of my, a lot of my upbringing was, well, you know, you need to do something that, that you know, can, you can earn a living, you know, be an artist, uh, just doesn't quite pay the bills, you know, maybe you should be a doctor. And, um, and that was something that was just very, you know, fixed in my mind that, you know, art wasn't a profession. 
and uh, you know, it was usually uh, you know something something you know uh, that most people would do to earn an income. Um, surprisingly, it wasn't until I went to Thailand, uh, like in high school, and uh, I was I was touring the country and looking around and seeing that there really was no artwork that was being created by Thai artists. There was no, there was no culture involved in creating its own cultural identity. Like, I'll give you an example. So when I was at my cousin's place one time, we were playing, we were playing a PlayStation and we were playing a, a video game in Japanese. And I, I remember looking at my, <laughs> remember looking at my cousin and asking him, I said, uh, what are we supposed to do in this game? I don't understand anything. And he looks at me and he says, I don't, I don't speak or read Japanese. I don't understand. And I said, well, how come we're playing a Japanese PlayStation? And he looks at me and he says, because they don't make Thai PlayStations. Like we basically, like if there's any kind of pop culture we want, we take it from other countries. We take it from other cultures. Like there's no, there's no, you know, like pop culture that exists in Thailand per se. And that's when I kind of understood where my parents were coming from saying like, there's no profession uh, as an artist in Thailand because at the time it was all the artwork was done by monks and temples. And like, that was the majority of the artwork that you see. Now in the last, I would say in the last seven or eight years, you're actually seeing this evolution of uh, pop culture evolving from Thailand and it's fantastic, um, but you know, you get this better understanding of, of your family and your heritage when you actually, you know, kind of immerse yourself into it. And so it wasn't until I got into college and my parents, uh, you know, like I was on my way to, you know, possibly pursuing uh, a life in uh, medicine. And all my roommates in college, they told me like, hey, you should see maybe if you can just get into art school. And it was, it was that encouragement from my friends that uh, got me to apply to art school. And it wasn't until I got accepted into art school when I realized, hey, this might be a reality. So that's, that's the long end of it. Well, we are very lucky you didn't become a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Min, how, how did you become an author? Did you always, was crafting words and, you know, making those words, the words you choose be so powerful? Is that always something you did or how did you, how did you come to, to that? That's a, I mean, that's a great question in that I'm very kind of like a shy person, especially as a kid, I was like super shy. I'm like, almost like never talk. I think I would go over to friends' house sometimes and like their parents would be like, does, does this kid? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, kind of like my, my grandfather who inspired the story, he was also like a man of few words. So it's kind of strange to become an author who makes their living from words when like, I'm very kind of like not a person, uh, I'm not very vocal person myself. Um, but I think that's why picture books appeal to me because it's a way to tell stories by partnering with an illustrator like Dan, where there's, I have, I feel like I have more story than I have words. And this way I can kind of put an idea down and convey it with a combination of text and a combination of, of artwork. And it's, to me, it's the, the way of storytelling that feels the, like the best fit. I, I describe, I've tried to talk, talk to people about it and I kind of describe it like working with, with artists is, my job is almost like to like clear space for the artist to work. So I imagine like if you're going camping and like my job is like clearing the ground for the campsite and then hand it over to Dan and I walk away. I come back <laughs> expecting like a tent and I come back and there's like this like castle with like a rocket ship and like, it's, it's like always a, an amazing experience to see where um, illustrators can take these ideas and then run with them. Um, but the great thing I always tell people is that even though the illustrators like Dan take the story to a place that I couldn't have possibly imagined, it's still always the, the story I had in mind, which to me is like the, the magic of this type of storytelling. Um, I just love that it's a, it's a kind of book and a kind of artistic experience that people of all ages can, can appreciate. And that if you, if you have this book when you're a kid, if it's something that really does resonate with you, that's like a friend that you can take with you like throughout your lifetime. So this is, to be able to have a work of art that can kind of like travel with you over time is something that's really special to me. It is certainly really special. It captures the imagination. One of, one of the questions I have for you is about, um, well, I guess I have two. One is, and a few people actually have written in with this one already, 
how did you decide the grandfather would speak Thai and not Vietnamese? Mm -hmm. um, and also, why doesn't the boy have a name? Or does he, and, and we've missed it. Interesting. Um, I'll, I'll tackle the, the first question about Thai versus Vietnamese because I actually have um, some family who would ask me, you're the author, couldn't you just make the illustrator do it Vietnamese? <laughs> um, <laughs> but for, for me, because it's such a collaborative process, I wrote the story based on my experience, but in the manuscript, I included a note to Dan saying, if you wanted to take this idea and illustrate it from your own perspective and like put in your own cultural experience, that would be great. Because for me, I want the illustrator to be invested in the story and to bring themselves to the, to the page so it becomes our book, right? So for me, even though the characters are speaking Thai, um, it's still very much my experience. I think one of the things about like Pan-Asian ethnicity and our identity is that the, there are so many similarities between cultures. And so this to me, even though the, the characters are Thai and speaking Thai, it feels like it's pulled straight out of my, my, my personal background. And those scenes where the boy and the grandfather are sitting next to each other on the couch, not sure how to talk, those are like straight out of my experience. Um, as far as like the illustration details, I want to note to Dan that um, in my mind, the grandfather was probably wearing like a flowing brown robe, a very simple thing. So the fact that you had to go to that level of detail was totally a, um, an unforced error on your part and a self-inflicted wound. <laughs> I remember when I first saw that artwork, I was like, I don't know how his wrists are still attached to his arms, <laughs> the level of detail that you put in there. Um, but yeah, I was thrilled that Dan took it and, and made it his own. I'm not sure if you want to, to talk about the, the Thai aspect of it at all. Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, you know, just uh, in, in terms of the, cult, the comfort level uh, of, of, you know, um, I don't want to say cultural appropriation, like I, I just, I felt more comfortable in my wheelbase of illustrating from a, from a Thai point of view. And just, you know, being familiar with the rich, lovely details in, in, Thai, in Thai art, um, you know, just, I felt, I felt like I could really do it justice and I could really, you know, do something really special. Also, just from my point of view, uh, just in, in children's literature, I think I know of maybe two other books that feature uh, Thai, Thai characters. And so, I'm, you know, I, admittedly, maybe I was a little selfish where I just said, you know what, I want to make, I want to make the third, you know, Thai, <laughs> Thai character based book. Um, and so, but also, uh, you know, I, I mean, to, to, to add to Min's point about making it our project. Uh, I just knew that if I invested my own personal uh, passion into it, like I was just going to, you know, do 110% uh, on this job. And that's always something that an artist kind of needs to do to connect, like just, you know, uh, put in just as much passion into the text as, as you do. And if you really feel connected to it, as much as I do, because, you know, uh, Min and I have shared our stories about not being able to uh, communicate with our grandparents. Like to me on a personal level, like this was, this was a book that, I wish I had written and, and, but I could totally 110% relate to. And so uh, for me, it was, it was my opportunity to put uh, my own footprint into it and, you know, also, you know, dedicate it to my grandmother. Mm -hmm. So what I love about, oh, sorry, I was gonna add one thing. Go ahead. Go what for I love it. about it is that um, it's a very specific story for me, from my experience and then illustrated from Dan's experience. Um, and it feels like it's culturally very specific but what's been great about having the book out in the world and talking to people is that you have so many people coming up to you after readings saying that the book resonates with them. And sometimes it's someone who has a similar experience of not being able to speak with their grandparents. But sometimes it's people who come up and say, I spoke English to my grandparents, but we weren't able to connect. We couldn't find that common ground until we um, discovered cooking or painting or drawing together. And so it's, and an interesting and to me magical thing where you dive into this very specific story and then you land with something that's more universal that a lot of different readers can can appreciate and resonate with. Right. I know I've gotten I've gotten a lot of compliments and, and comments from people outside of the Asian American community. You know, it's, you know, Latino, African American, uh, you know, uh, European. Just it's, it's 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 a universal thing about not being able to communicate with your grandparents, apparently. <laughs> So in terms of um, one of the questions that I, that I received was, did either of you actually sit down and draw with one of your grandparents as you were growing up or, or write? 
Uh, I I did not, but I remember going to Thailand and my and my father's brother, my uncle, uh, you know, he had a pharmacy in Thailand. But uh, my dad, I remember introducing me to him, and uh, he was very he was very artistic. But um, you know, it was it wasn't one of these things that he pursued as a profession. Uh, but I guess he used to uh, he used to draw like little cities on grains of rice. You know, so I mean, somewhere in my bloodline, there there is that artistic gene, but uh, I never I never took it upon myself to draw with any member of the family. I mean, the closest I had was when I was uh, with my cousins, uh, and and you know, they I think they marveled at the fact that I could draw, so they would just sit and watch me draw, but we wouldn't draw together. But you know, they would just watch me draw. Um, it's interesting because I. I grew up, even though I don't um, draw and paint right now, um, or much right now, I grew up drawing and painting a lot, and I was always kind of in my head and sketching and stuff. And I remember one time in high school, going over to my, or maybe middle school, going over to my grandparents' house for a New Year celebration, a Lunar New Year celebration, and there are these beautiful signs up on the wall, <laughs> on this, these beautiful signs in calligraphy. And I asked my parents who made them. And they're like, oh, that's your, your grandfather painted those. And I found out from that point that as a kid or as a young man, he wanted to be an artist. He loved painting. He wanted to become a painter. But kind of like Dan, like there wasn't a, a path forward for him in that way. So he became, he started working for the, the government. And, but he always had that artistic bent and like artistic inclination, which is something I kind of discovered at that point. And I feel like we never sat down and painted the way the characters here do, but it, that discovering that my grandfather had that side to him kind of like really revealed uh, something else to me about him. Like that scene in the book where you turn the page and it says like they see each other for the first time. That was one of those moments where I thought I saw him for the first time because I feel like a lot of times with people in your life, whether it's your grandparents or your parents, it's easy to kind of like put them into these boxes of, of um, these categories. And like, this is my grandfather. And I don't necessarily always think about like what his like hopes and dreams or like artistic thoughts might be beneath that surface. Um, so for me to kind of like peel back that one layer um, and see him as someone who had artistic dreams and aspirations was really meaningful to me. I think something that inspired this this book. Thank you. Very thoughtful. And and one of the things I, I thought we could share actually is I heard um, that you actually have a new book, a new book that represents collaboration. And obviously, Min's been busy creating that that clear space um, for Dan to be creative and to do expressive characters and sequential art. Um, so the new book is called Lift. We actually can share a cover of it. And it came out um, it came out very recently, I think in the beginning of May. Um, and I was hoping that we could you guys could talk a little bit about your collaboration and the storyline. We actually even have a preview of one of the one of the slides we can share, one of the spreads. Sure. Yeah, I, we can. I, I'd love to, to talk about this this book. It was so much fun to do drawn together, and the publisher was so pleased with how it came out that they they asked um, right before drawn together even hit the shelves. They're like, "Do you have another book? That we, let's get another book going with you and Dan." Oh, um, is that right? I didn't. Yeah, know that. and that's that one of those more another one of those pressure moments of like, okay, let's. <laughs> I have sixteen hours. <laughs> um, but this one is about a, a young girl who has a, a little brother, and her favorite thing in the world to do is push elevator buttons. And one day, and that's always her job. But then one day, her parents let her brother push the button, and she ends up throwing a a bit of a tantrum. But she, at one point, she discovers a magic elevator button that she tapes up next to her closet door. And when she pushes it, the closet transforms into this magic elevator that takes her to these fantastic um, places. And for me, I got the idea first when, well, first of all, I had two boys and they always love to push elevator buttons. And wherever I go somewhere, you see kids, every kid I've ever seen loves to push the elevator buttons. So I figured there must be something there. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> I remember getting into an elevator with my infant son again and watching his eyes as the door closed and we were going up and down. I was like, what must this experience be like for a baby to walk into this like strange room, have the doors closed, and then they, there's this ding 
and then the doors open and you're somewhere completely different. I was like, that must be such a surreal, when, when the whole world is such a strange place, that must be one of the um, stranger things that, <laughs> that happens to you. And so my next thought was obviously naturally, well, what if the elevator actually did take you somewhere completely different? And then that's, that's how the idea came about. I was very jealous because it, it was the kind of idea that I wish I had written and he just knocked it out of the park. <laughs> um, the, the great thing about this book is, so a little behind the scenes, there's the, the girl in her home and then she pushes the button and the door opens up. In the manuscript, it's basically the door opens up and she goes somewhere awesome. <laughs> and then <laughs> left, that, left that totally up to Dan to kind of think about where he wanted to take her and like what he wants to illustrate. So this one is even more of a kind of like meeting halfway because it's very much like I wrote like part took the story part way and then like threw it over to Dan to like kind of fill in the blanks, um, yeah. which is really fun. He threw a, he threw a blank canvas at me, said take her wherever you want, and it was just like you know it was one of those cases where the possibilities were endless, and uh, you know I remember there were multiple ideas that were going through my head. Um, I remember there was I remember there was one idea where I said, "Oh, maybe it would be cool if uh, she went to some alien planet and just like hung out with these aliens or something like that." And I remember asking myself, "Do I want to take it to that level?" You know. Um, and then there were even more simple ideas, like uh, you know, appearing on a deserted beach, uh, you know, uh, climbing the Himalayan mountains by herself and waving at some mountain climbers. Um, and, you know, I kind of, I pulled back because, I, you know, just with, with young kids, I think you can impress them with, with you know, even normal things because they're so fresh and new at life that, you know, if you were to say, we have a magic door, like that's, that's plenty. It doesn't have to go to the level of, oh, we went to this alien cantina, you know, light years away. It could just simply be, oh my gosh, this magic door took us to, you know, uh, Arby's or, <laughs> or something, you know, just like, this is pretty neat. Um, These days, so I, the world is just magic, no matter what. <laughs> right, right. You know, actually, in one of the drafts, they do go to Arby's. No, <laughs> <laughs> no. I, I think the book is so uplifting, and and for me, um, as a parent as well, to watch, um, you know, Iris, the main character, end up deciding to take to take her. I don't. I hope it's not spoiler, but to take her sibling, you know, with her on on a journey on that imagination trip. And I think in times like these, especially with COVID nineteen and shelter in place, um, it's it's especially important to think about um, siblings and the interaction of siblings. So I think lifts right now for for every household is is, is really a, I would almost say a must because. It, drawn together, which is why we're here, is is a must as well. But I think Lyft also helps provide this amazing um, perspective for for young kids um, to think about how to include others and how to share those special imag imagination and creative experiences. Um, you know what? I actually have two two people on the line who would like to ask some questions, um, and I I'm wondering if that can happen. So I, I believe Kara and Maya. Um, if Kara could ask, a, if, does Kara have a question? I see something coming through that um, there might be a... Hello, Hi. Kara. Hi, Kara. Hello, Hi. Kara. Welcome. Um, Hello. I, I love the moment in Drawn Together where the dragon that was separating the grandfather and the son, and I mean, and the grandson were, was, so being with with the thing that connected them and allowed them to bring bring them together. So, what were each of your favorite moments in the book? What either in the process of making it or while reading it? Huh. That's, a, that's a great question. I'm so glad you liked that part because that that means a lot to me too. Um, I'll I'll answer first if, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah, I'm thinking. Um, yeah. I mean, one thing I love about you picking up on that detail is that, like, the dragon, particularly in, like, Vietnamese culture and, like, a lot of Asian culture, isn't, a, like, a, a terrifying or a scary thing. It's something that's, like, auspicious and good luck. And for me, that moment when they use that dragon to bring them together is almost like the, the boy was afraid of the, the weight of his culture and he wasn't comfortable with that. The fact that he was able to come 
together and like overcome that own like personal fear what that, that meant to me and if i'm not sure if you noticed this but if you look on the the scene where the grandfather and grandson are watching tv um on the tv is that that same dragon so to me in the book this is the moment where they felt the most distant and they the boy kind of gives up and they, he walks away so when the dragon was there the last time is when he wasn't able to overcome it and that distance kind of he succumbed to that distance so when the dragon reappears at the end and instead of letting the dragon win and kind of walking away the fact that they're able to find a way across and reconnect is very meaningful to me so i'm really glad that you picked up on that and that you like that detail uh for me i think i think my favorite part of of the of the book is um when they start when they start drawing together um you know you see the grandfather looking over and you see you know the grandson sketching in the book and then the grandfather runs off to get his sketchbook um and then you're watching you know you're watching them kind of draw but you don't exactly know what each of them is making and then when you turn the page it's it's the world that they that they've built together and and uh for me i mean looking at the man <laughs> looking at the manuscript uh, and this is a this is a story that Min and I share uh, that we find that's very hilarious because in the manuscript, his art note basically was uh, <laughs> draw a world that words can't describe. <laughs> and you know when you get an art note like that, that can be very daunting. And so I you know the fact that I was capable of of expressing that in art to me was just like a personal accomplishment. It was like a it was like a very bold challenge that I was able to fulfill. And uh, you know, to results that I was personally pleased with. So for me, I think uh, selfishly, it was just like, yes, I was challenged <laughs> and I got that. And in the end, um, the, the spread of, of them being surrounded by the mountains and the fish and the clouds, uh, that's also perhaps my most favorite illustration in the whole book. Maya, do you have a question too? Yes, actually I do. Um, did you purposely make the title a word play on drawing together and being drawn together? I, I love that question. And um, the answer is yes. I was trying to figure out something that would both capture the, the artistic aspect of it um, and like the literal drawing together, but then also kind of at the same time talk about how that is what's drawing them together. So you're, you're, you're spot on that um, there are at least two meanings to that title. There may be more that I haven't figured out yet. But, but yes, I was, that was something that I was hoping to, to have with the title. So I'm glad that that came through to you. Um, I would just encourage everyone out in the audience to definitely write in your questions. We are taking questions as we continue the conversation. Um, Kara, do you have any additional questions that you'd like to ask? Um, yeah. Uh this one doesn't have to do as much with the book, but I was wondering if either of you had any other professions you wanted to pursue other than becoming an author and illustrator. Mm, yes, um, I I roast my own coffee. I like I like roasting coffee. I don't know if I want to make it into a profession, but it's a hobby that I'm very passionate about. Uh, I also have a wood shop in my basement, so I like to build furniture. Um, Right now, I'm, I'm coming up with a, uh, I'm, I'm designing a chair that's also a bookshelf. And then uh, just recently during, during this entire pandemic, I, I took it upon myself to uh, build a ukulele out of cardboard. <laughs> and so this, wow. it works. So wow. it, it, it works. I've been playing it for the last uh, five, six weeks. Um, just something to keep my hands busy uh, and, uh, you know, yeah, I think I think because this is a constant question that that my other artist friends and I come up with, and it's like, if you couldn't, if if children's publishing just completely collapsed tomorrow, what would you do? And I and and I think my answer would be that I would I would be a furniture maker, and that would that would be that would be my profession. Making chairs that only words can even words can't describe. <laughs> right, right. Just these weird like what? If, how come there's three handles to this? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, Kara, that's a, that's a great question. I actually have, still have a day job and I work in early childhood policy. So it's a different kind of writing and working on trying to create policies that help um, young children stay, stay safe and get a high quality education 
Um, so that's a job I've been doing for a long time. But all along the way, I knew that I still had that dream of becoming a children's book author. And so that's the thing that I finally decided to go for. And um, if I had to do, I, I would say at some point I would like, or I always thought that I would like to illustrate um, myself. But now having seen how much work goes into it, I might just <laughs> the writing part. <laughs> Um, Maya, do you have any additional questions you'd like to ask? Yeah, I actually have two questions for Dan. Um, how long did it take you to draw Grandpa's superhero? And was it easier or more difficult to write, um, do, more difficult to draw, um, draw illustrations for authors that had not a lot of words? Oh, okay. So to answer your first question, uh, to draw to draw Grandpa's super character was very it was a very detailed process. Um, I would say to draw him once with just all the little details and all the little studs and the crown and everything. Like I would say each drawing probably took oh easily about forty five minutes to an hour each. And you know um, and also like I remember I would have these brush pens filled with ink. And uh, I remember by the time I was done with the whole project, I had gone through five or six brush prints because it just took so much ink. Um, and then the uh, and then to answer your other question, um, is it is it easier to is it easier to illustrate a book with fewer words? Uh, yes and no. Uh, reason being, uh, like for example, our our most recent book, uh, Lift. Uh, you know, Min, Min gives a lot of uh, narrative details in the manuscript uh, and, and uh, it ends up, the book almost ends up playing more like a graphic novel. There's a lot of panels where you, the, the, the narrative is, 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 what, uh, is what tells a story. And so this case, it relies heavily on illustrations. So if anything, you find yourself doing more illustrations in order to have a clear narrative. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes sometimes there's that nice balance of words and illustrations that can that can save you a lot of that heavy lifting. But I, I personally, I love making graphic novels. I'm actually working on two right now. Um, but you know that that puts a big investment on me to like inject the emotion and the and 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 the getting the facial details right so that the narrative is clear in the story. Um, Gosh, I mean, I guess to answer your question, like, I don't, I don't know if I would prefer either or, uh, but, uh, you know, if, if it is a, if it is a request from the author to, to do more of a narrative in, uh, in the book with more illustrations than words, um, I'm more than happy to oblige. Um, I would say, I would say the experiences between Drawn Together and Lift have, have been equal. Um, my heart, I think, oh gosh. My heart definitely goes more towards drawn together for a personal reason, but uh, the the artwork and lift to me resonates a little bit uh, more professionally because it just has kind of a more cinematic aspect. You know, that's not true. I love drawn together too. Um, I just I'll do whatever Min does. If Min has another book, I'll do another one gladly. My next manuscript is just going to be like a blank piece of paper. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Um, since you since you brought up the the grandfather's artwork, I wanted to share. I'm going to embarrass Dan here. <laughs> one of, my, one of um, my most prized possessions in our house. I pulled this off the wall. Is a original art that Dan sent of the the, the grandfather, and you can see like all the intricate brushwork. And, um, and I don't like that frame. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> You know, he sent it to me with this really thoughtful note on the back that I stuck in here that says, I think your grandfather would have been proud. And I was like, okay. because this book um, was about my grandfather, but he unfortunately passed away before I was able to sh actually share it with him. So that, that really meant a lot to me. So um, I'm glad I wasn't arrogant to say, yeah, your grandfather definitely would have loved it. <laughs> your grandfather would have been proud of me. <laughs> <laughs> Min and Dan, uh you know, since COVID-19 has hit, I know that there has been an increase in um, prejudice against Asian Americans. And one of the questions that I wanted to ask you was, have you experienced it or do you know anyone else who has experienced um, some of the prejudice as a result of COVID-19 and the increase in xenophobia? Um, and also someone asked and wrote in about, was it harder, do you think, even getting off the ground being Asian American in terms of writing and in terms of 
um, illustrating in terms of even building a network. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and you're, you're right that it's a, it can be a scary time out there right now. Um, and I, I personally haven't experienced anything directly, but I have a lot of close friends who have um, had certain words thrown at them when they're out with their families and just walking down the street. And it's, it's really unfortunate. Um, it's, a, it's a tough thing to figure out what your role as, a, as an author is during this time. Um, my, my hope is that with, I mean, part of the reason why a lot of this, this racial, racist um, stuff is being hurled out there is because I think people aren't seeing other people as fully human, right? So you're seeing, you have certain preconceived notions about um, Asian-ness and this otherness, especially with these fears that come along with the pandemic. And then when you strip away that a whole subgroup of people's humanity, then that's like the feeding ground for, for a lot of this racism. Um, my hope is that books like Drawn Together and other ones that are out there kind of counteract that and create works that celebrate the, the fuller humanity of, of all of us and particularly Asian Americans in a way that's affirming for within the community. So Asian American readers who are reading it kind of like feel fulfilled by that and see them reflected in those books. Um, but then also for, for other people reading, maybe they'll, they'll think twice about, about it if they can see other people and imagine what their inner lives might be like. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a definitely a scary time and I hope everyone stays safe out there. And, um, and yeah, as far as breaking into the industry, um, I think there's been a tremendous amount of progress and movement in the kind of like the diversification of what's out there in publishing. I saw someone recently about like, and I said like, this feels to me like the golden age of picture books. And they're like, can you explain what you mean by that? And I was like, hmm, <laughs> let, me, let me think about that. I was like, and I kind of came down to like, this to me feels like a very expansive kind of children's books. Like there's the amount of stories and the, the breadth of stories that are being put out there are, is, is greater than anything I've seen before. So I feel very fortunate to be coming up at a time when there is a, a movement in that direction and there's more receptivity to that. And I know there's a long way to go, but um, I'm glad to, to be a part of it. Thank you. I, agree. I, feel, I, feel like, I feel like diversity has been a, a big thing in the last, especially in the last four, four or five years. Uh, you can even see it, you can even see it on Netflix. Like there's a lot of Asian centric shows, um, you know, like I'm a huge fan of Kin's Convenience, for example. Um, and in terms of, in terms of uh, just uh, experiencing racism, I, I haven't seen too much of that. I live in, I live in uh, the Pasadena area. Uh, well, just south of it in Alhambra, which is a very uh, Asian Latino centric community. So uh, yeah, you, you're just kind of, you're just kind of in a, in, in a network of other minorities who just, you know, they just understand the struggle. And for, for, for our neighborhood just south of Alhambra, you have uh, Monterey Park, which is actually where a lot of people in the LA Chinatown district moved to um, after, you know, uh, just, I, I feel, to my understanding, I believe like Chinatown just got a little too expensive. So everyone just moved to Monterey Park. So I'm, I'm pretty much in the heart of of uh, Asian you know Asian uh, culture you know you'll you'll even go down some neighborhoods in my in my street like you'll go down Valley Boulevard and you'll and you'll drive down the street and you'll see signs that are just in Cantonese and <laughs> I died I actually they don't even bother to tell you like it's a it's a restaurant or a store you're just like uh, we're not we're in a very Asian community you know like it's so it's it's a very it's a very I mean I have to say I think for me it's a very comfortable space to be in and uh, you know, just kind of connect with other people that can pretty much relate to the struggle. Thank you. Um, you know, I've I've had the um, the benefit of sharing you for the last hour with everyone, and I, I don't want to take advantage of your generosity. So um, I didn't know if either of you had any closing closing tips. I know one thing that someone is. Is keeps on writing in is about secrets. Is there any secret in any of your other books that they should be aware of? Because I even know, you know, my my own son has loved this book, right? And when I watched that read aloud, I learned all sorts of secrets I had no idea. So, what other secrets are you hiding um, that you're only telling your your nearest and dearest? Uh, for me, I think, I think this is a, this is a universal, uh, Easter egg that's in all of my books, uh, is that whenever you see a car 
and you look at the car license plate, the license plate will be 2BZK131. And the story goes back to my childhood when my parents and I, we were taking a vacation up to Canada and we were in this horrible blue Cherokee that kept breaking down constantly. And I remember on our way up to uh, Canada, we were gonna take a trip up to Vancouver. Uh, the car broke down in, uh, in, uh, in Washington. And um, I just remember we were at this uh, auto garage trying to get it figured out. And, um, and while the mechanic's talking about how he fixed the car with a wire clothes hanger to pinch two wires together, I remember staring at the license plate of the car and it said 2BZK131. And you know, like my mind is filled with just worthless knowledge and that just happens to be one of those little tidbits about this little lemon of a car that we had in the 80s and the license plate was 2BZK131. So in any point of any of my books, if you see a car and you see a license plate, you will see the license plate of that blue Cherokee. And I, I put it in every book I can possibly do just kind of as an inside joke to myself. Awesome. Um, and yeah, th this doesn't, I don't think this counts as a secret. If, if I were, cause since I'm not the illustrator, I don't have as much to, to sneak in. <laughs> <laughs> with, um, with Lyft, I'm not gonna spoil anything since people haven't, a lot of people haven't read it yet, but um, Dan printed out this or shared online this amazing elevator button that you can print out and cut out. So my boys and I yesterday just printed it out and put it on like their, their closet doors. So we've been playing all kinds of adventures and like I think we've been to, to Egypt to explore the pyramids and we've been on a space canoe fishing for, for alien or with aliens. Um, so for, for the kids out there who are feeling kind of cooped up and getting stuck inside and doing your best to stay inside, if you wanted to, to use this button to, to imagine yourself being able to go on any kind of adventure from the safety of your own home, um, I, would, I would encourage that. And that, that's a secret that you can figure out on, on your own where, where the elevator door leads. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And thank you both to Maya and Kara for your thoughtful questions. Yeah, thank, you. Um, thank you, ladies. Thank you. I'd like to leave everyone with a quick challenge. And I'd like you to grab your sketchbook. Oh, nice. um, obviously, okay. this one's been inspired by, <laughs> by Drawn Together. And I challenge you in your sketchbook to take a pencil or some crayons and to create your own story, to draw a picture of you and the people you've spent so much time with over the last few months. Um, and, and after you do that, I'd like you to consider posting it. Um, PBS right now is collecting stories. It's actually called the American Portrait. And this is a collection of stories contributed by people all over the world, excuse me, all over the country. Um, and so by you drawing a picture here or collaging a picture before you cut a photo, though, please ask your parent. Um, and you can take a photo of that and you can upload it and you can share it. You can also share it on social with the hashtag American Portrait PBS. Um, we'd love to see it and it would be a lot of fun to share your story. Um, Min and Dan, thank you so very much for sharing your story today. Um, it, it just was so wonderful and it, it's so fabulous to have two um, amazingly creative and imaginative people together um, sharing their craft. And so thank you very much. And we have some credits to run. So thank you, thank you for, for, for inviting time. us for having us. Thank you. It's an honor and a pleasure. Oh, is this your blooper reel? and watch the credits because you will soon see the blooper reel. I hope elevator music is playing over it.
Hi there. My name is Minlay, and thank you so much for joining me today for, uh, and it is illustrated by So whenever I go over to their house, I we, whenever so whenever I go over to that, so shall I begin? Um, so with that, um, so with that, I hope you enjoyed this story time, and ooh, I almost forgot. Um. I almost forgot something. Um, 